It was a scholarship. But uh, it's just not my thing. I never knew anybody could ride a horse and play golf. If he did, he could play polo. <laughs> but uh, we fast forward to St. Andrew, uh, to uh, St. Rule's colonizing, uh, starting a little town on the coast of, of Scotland, northern Scotland, on the east side of the island. And uh, it's named St. Andrew. Well, we're going to fast forward another full 500 years. Matt Fergus was king of the Scots, and you'll find him in the history of Scotland. Find him on the internet. But uh, Matt Fergus was king of, the, king of the Scots, and he'd been told that the British were coming again, and at this time, they were going to whip those Scots the last and final time and never have to worry about them again. They're going to subdue those cantankerous Scots. Now, they were Christianized by then, McFergus got the PICS, the P-I-C-T-S, and that's a word I never have studied enough to talk intelligently about it, but it's another ethnic group that lived in Scotland, and he united the PICS and the Scots and went south toward England to what is today, I think, the border between Scotland and England, and there's a river flows out of the highlands to the sea. They camped on the north bank of that river, the Athelstein River, and waited for the British Army to appear. And sure enough, one afternoon, the British Army started pouring over that hill on the other side of the river and camping on the, the river bank and the hillside across the river from it. And Mac Ferguson, I doubt if he had a or whatever, but he was watching, he was counting, and he was quite concerned when he went to bed that night. He, had, he knew he was pretty badly outnumbered. And that night, he had probably a very fitful sleep, and he had a vision. The vision was an X-shaped cross in the sky, in the shape of the St. Andrew cross. White clouds on a blue background. And he dreamed that if he, could, if he saw that cross in the morning, the Scots and the Picts would be victorious. Well, I don't know how much he slept before daylight, but the next morning he woke all of his lieutenants, told them what he'd seen, and sure enough, the wind opened that X-shaped cross in the sky that morning. And in case you're not part Scotch, or never was around any, never were around any, <laughs> Scots are prone to get a little bit excited once in a while. And, and uh, I'm sure there was great jubilation. They probably had songs and sang and cheered and, and whatever. And to make a long story short, they whipped the British that day. And that St. Andrew's cross, that white X in the sky was talked about and not long after that, a dark blue, well, medium blue flag with a white cross became the national flag of Scotland. And many of you have probably seen the Scottish flag because most of us are Scotch and Irish uh, to some extent, one extent or another. Well, I'm going to fast forward again to July 1861, Battle of Manassas. It was a hot day and that gunpowder from muskets and, and cannons was, was thick as could be and it wasn't enough breeze to blow it away and you know the, the morning of that battle it was kind of seesaw back and forth. It looked like the north was going to win, the south was going to win, back and forth. And <coughs> General Beauregard was a feisty little Frenchman. And I think I know, <laughs> I think I know some of General Beauregard's descendants. No, not really. But uh, Pat and I lived in Louisiana 17 years, and I have been around some Frenchmen, some of the Cajuns. And they are animated when they get interested in something, when they support something, or whether they are against something. You always know where a Cajun stands. And I can just imagine General Beauregard when one of his lieutenants came to him and said, Sir, there are, are troops coming over the mountain to our left or our right. I don't remember which way they were coming, but anyhow, he, uh, 
he went to where he could see these approaching troops and he couldn't tell what flag they were flying because the wind wasn't blowing, the, the cloth was just hanging limp from the pole and the first national of this flag, the battle flag did not exist then. The first national when it was just drooping, you could see a white canton and maybe a star in it in the upper left hand corner. You can see the red and white stripes. Well, the first national has got a, a blue canton with white stars and red and white stripes. And they didn't know whose troops they were. They were clad in blue, the soldiers were. But especially at first Manassas, most men in the, the Confederate Army and the Yankee Army were wearing blue uniforms because what, that's what they'd worn when they were in militia. So, excuse me, they were wearing blue, but that didn't mean they were those lying, cheating, thieving, socialistic damn Yankees. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, they, they were watching this group of men. General Beauregard knew the importance of them being Confederate because a flank attack. <clears throat> You know, in those days, they lined up in two lines, and they shot one another, standing there or marching toward one another. They shot one another back and forth until one line broke up and ran. And that wasn't much of a way to fight battle, but that's what they did in those days. And a group of soldiers attacking from the left or the right flank always determined the battle. And they were quite apprehensive about whose men those were. And presently, a gust of wind opened that flag up, and it was the first national. And they say that General Beauregard fairly danced around and said, They're ours! They're ours! We win the day! And I can just hear that little Frenchman in the excitement that went on then. I feel it. Every time I tell this story, I love to think about how eager our men were for freedom. How bad they wanted to rule themselves instead of have a bunch of boneheads in Washington tell them what to do. But to make a long story short, now, they were Confederate. They did win the battle and ran the Yankees back to the, the city of the other side of the river. General Beauregard and General Johnson, now General Joe Johnson, was, was, uh, was shared the command of the troops that day at First Manassas. And they talked about, after the battle, the need for a flag that didn't look like the U.S. flag. And they put out a call for a battle flag. They got over a hundred designs. Now, if you read one or two of these books about the origin of the battle flag, one author in particular will tell you there is no visible, obtainable, findable, seeable, connection between the battle flag and St. Andrew's cross. But God has his way. And even though nobody recorded that the design sent by, sent by William, submitted by William Porcher Miles, which was pretty close to what we see today, nobody has a written connection to that design in the St. Andrew's cross. But all of those men knew what the first, what the uh, national flag of Scotland looked like. And one of them saw that blue flag with that white cross. And he drew up something about like that. It's changed very little because he knew what the St. Andrew's cross was. And most of our ancestors revered that cross as a 